Hello, and welcome to the Atron Microscope Unit. My name is Richard Webster. The Atron Microscope Unit is in the basement of the Chemical Sciences Building, and we provide electron microscope facilities and expertise to researchers across the university, from honours level students to professors. Uh, today, we will be making a TM sample with your nanoparticle sample, and then looking at it under the electron microscope. So, let's get started. We are now standing in the sample preparation lab of the electron microscope unit. Uh, we need to get our sample preparation right uh, in order to get good TM images. So let's discuss what makes good TM sample. Firstly, we need to have a, a thin TM sample. So in transmission electron microscopy, the electron beam goes through the sample and we need the electrons to be able to pass through that without getting absorbed too much. So our sample needs to be less than 100 nanometers thick and hopefully your nanoparticles will be less than 100 nanometers thick. Secondly, we need to have a single layer of nanoparticles. If we have multiple layers of nanoparticles, then the edges of the nanoparticles will overlap with each other and we won't be able to get an accurate measurement of their size. And so to make an accurate measurement of their size, we need a single layer of nanoparticles. So what we're going to do is we're going to dilute your sample with a uh, just water and then sonicate it and by the end of this we should have an homogeneous solution uh, with the nanoparticles evenly distributed and no clumping or aggregation of the nanoparticles and then we're going to take 20 microliters and drop cast that onto the TM grid which will hold the specimen so that we can put it into the TM and image it. So, so let's take a look at the tools that we'll need to do this. This is a TM grid. Uh, this is a three millimeter copper disc with a square array of holes. Uh, we can see a magnified image of this on slide three of the notes. We use the bars created by those holes to support a thin carbon film, which will sit over the holes, and we deposit the sample onto that carbon film. When the solution evaporates, we're left with the particles on the film. We will also need a pipette to measure out a small quantity of solution, roughly 20 microliters, and uh, we're going to use that to drop that onto the grid, and while we do that we will hold the grid using our self-closing tweezers. Uh, for a size comparison, uh, this is that grid. Here I have uh, 50 microliters of the nanoparticles in the citrate solution. We're going to dilute this down so that we get a uh, nice thin layer of the nanoparticles on the TM grid when we come to drop cast it. And what we're going to do is take 50 microliters of the millicue water and uh, add that to the nanoparticle solution. Um, and you should be able to see just in the bottom there, uh, just here, there is the nanoparticle solution. So here we have our sample that has been diluted. And to create a monodispersed solution, we are going to put it in the sonicator for 15 minutes. Uh, at the end of this, we should have broken up any clumps of nanoparticles that may have formed, and we will end up with a solution we can drop cast onto the TM grid. So we'll put that in, press play, and we can see that. This will take 15 minutes, so uh, we'll come back later. Okay, after 15 minutes have passed, uh, we'll now take the sample out of the sonicator. Um, and we're now ready to drop cast the sample onto the TM film. So with my 20 microliter pipette, I'm going to pick up some of the uh, sample from the, uh, from the tube. Uh, I'm now going to drop cast this onto the TM grid. Uh, as you can see, I have the TM grid here. Uh, this is supported by the tweezers and we're going to drop the solution onto this.
So that was a little bit less than 20 micrometers. Now we have the sample on the TM grid. Uh, and if I get that into focus, you should be able to see the droplet formed. And uh, this droplet will take uh, approximately an hour to evaporate. Here is a sample under the light. Um, so we are just trying to speed up the process of evaporation. Okay, so one hour has passed. And as we can see, uh, the sample, uh, which did have a droplet on it, is now completely dry. And this sample is now ready to go into the TEM. We are now standing in the microscope room. And here we have the electron microscope. It's about 2.5 meters tall and weighs about two tons. So how does it work? Firstly, electrons are generated at the top of the microscope, round about here, by an electron gun. This extracts electrons from a filament made of tungsten by placing that in an electric field, which pulls electrons out. It then accelerates the electrons to 7.5 times the speed of light, at which point they have a wavelength of 2.5 picometers. So that is um, a thousand times smaller than our nanoparticles. And if we compare that to visible light, uh, which is about 500 nanometers, it's about 100,000 times smaller than that. And the, this small wavelength allows us to see much smaller things with the electron microscope than we can do with a visible light microscope. So, once the electrons have left the gun, at this point, uh, they see the first set of lenses. These are the condenser lenses. And these take the divergent beam of electrons leaving the filament, and then focus them into a parallel array of electrons, which they will then hit the sample and interact with the sample. Okay. So, the sample goes into a holder, which we'll see shortly, and this holder goes into a hole which is here, around about the middle of the microscope. Um, note that the whole microscope is in a vacuum, and this is to prevent any absorption of electrons by gas molecules, if otherwise not in a vacuum. So, at this point here, the electrons will interact with our sample, and some of them will scatter. About one in 1,000 will, will be scattered by the sample, and after that scattering has occurred, we have the objective lens, which is about here. This takes the scattered electrons and the unscattered electrons and focuses them all into an image of our sample. So this is the first point that we get to see the sample. However, this is a really, really small uh, size. And so we need to have some magnification lenses, which are this bulk here. Um, and these can magnify that small image from 50 times to 2 million times magnification. Uh, and at 2 million times magnification, we can start to see the atomic structure of the material we're looking at. Uh, finally, we need some way of detecting the electrons. Uh, we have two types of, well, we have two main detectors in this microscope. Firstly, we have a fluorescent screen, which is here. This is mainly used for the initial alignment of the microscope and, uh, and looking at the, the, sample, the, the image with our eyes. Um, so it's a fluorescent screen. When the electrons hit it, we see bright areas, and where it doesn't, we see dark areas, so we can see our image. And then finally, we have a digital camera. This is below the screen, around here. And uh, we can view that on the PC screen. And we can record these images for further analysis. Uh, so let's get the sample over in the holder. This is the sample holder, which we're going to put the sample into. Um, so the sample sits in this region here, and is held down by this clamp. Uh, the whole holder goes into the vacuum of the microscope, and these two O-rings seal off 
that vacuum. So we release the clamp using these two screws. And we place the sample. to there. And then we tighten the screws down to clamp the sample in place so that it doesn't fall off inside the vacuum. And now the sample is ready to go into the, into the vacuum, into the microscope. With the sample in the holder, we now put the holder into the microscope. So, we then need to wait for the microscope to pump down the sample chamber, at which point the rod will be fully inserted into the microscope. Okay, with the sample inside the microscope, we can now uh, start to view uh, the sample. So we are at a magnification of 150 times. Uh, this is a low magnification for the TM, um, but comparable to a high-powered optical microscope. So what we, I'm just moving the sample around, and what we can see is... Uh, almost a shadow of the, of the sample. So we have the dark lines. These dark lines are the uh, copper uh, grid bars um, that we saw on slide three. And uh, we can't see the whole of the, the copper disc, but we can just see a little, little portion of it. And these are the, those grid bars. Um, here the copper is far too thick, so any electrons that hit it get absorbed and uh, we don't get any uh, contrast. Any, any intensity from those regions. Um, but what we do see is we have bright regions uh, in between those bars. And those are the holes which have the carbon support film uh, over the top. And because the carbon film is very thin, about 10 nanometers, and it's made of carbon which is very light as an element, so the electron beam doesn't get scattered very much by it and passes straight through. Um, what we can see is that over here there are some areas uh, where there is material that is sat on top of the carbon film and those regions um, contain the sample. Uh, however, in the sample preparation we wanted to get a, a single thin uh, layer of the sample of the gold particles um, and not, not clumping. And this is evidence of clumping, so we will ignore that region and concentrate on a region such as this one. And uh, if I just show you the controls for, for a moment, um, we have the, 
this ball here, which moves the sample around. Oops, if I just focus. Yep. So the ball, trackball, I can move the sample around. Um, and then we have some knobs here. So we have the magnific magnification knob. We have a focus knob. And then on another panel, we have the uh, brightness knob. So if we just look here, I can increase, if I, sorry, magnification, I can increase. And we can see an increase in, in the magnification. So we're now at 400 times magnification. And we're just going to magnify on this uh, square here. Good. And if I increase the brightness, like so. OK. So now we can see uh, just one of the squares of the grid, one of the holes. And this has some, uh, some material inside it. So we will now go to a higher magnification of about uh, 6,000 times. Um, so I will just do that. Okay. So I just magnified on uh, this region of the sample. Uh, we are currently at a magnification of 6,000 times. And we can see that the particles are evenly spread across the, uh, across the sample across the image, and there are some regions of higher density uh, nanoparticles, but generally speaking, the sample is quite uniform, and that means that our, uh, our sample preparation was quite good. As we increase the magnification, uh, I'll do that over here, uh, we can see that even clearer, or more clearly. Uh, so we're now at a magnification of 30,000, let's go to 40,000, like so. And now we can see we have the whole view of the, um, uh, of the image uh, filled with nanoparticles. So this image will be good for measuring the size distribution of the nanoparticles uh, because we have a lot of particles. And we can see that they are uh, well separated out so we can see the edges of the particles, and we can accurately measure their size. Uh, if you notice the scale bar, um, we can measure these particles, and I think roughly they're around 10 nanometers uh, big. And to me, they look like they are uh, monodisperse, uh, all having roughly the same size. Um, we can see this region here, where the particles are more dense. I'll take an image of that. Um, in this region here, uh, it's not so good for the size determination. Um, if I magnify further to about 100,000 times and just increase the brightness to make it more visible, um, we can see, for example, here, we have a string of nanoparticles. Um, and they're all touching each other and slightly overlapping. What this means is we can't accurately see the, the edges, which we need to be able to do to measure their size. So we don't use regions like this for size determination. As I uh, keep increasing the magnification, so now we are at um, uh, 200,000 times, uh, we can see that some particles uh, appear darker than others. So let's, let's discuss where the uh, contrast in the, in the image comes from. Uh, I'll just focus like so. OK. So here we have um, the, the particles, and we have the carbon film. The carbon film is light, and the particles are dark. Again, the reason for that is that the uh, carbon film is a light element, doesn't contain that many uh, protons in the nucleus, and so doesn't scatter the electron beam very much when it passes through. Uh, compared to the gold, which is a larger nucleus, um, that nucleus is going to scatter the electron beam much more when the electron beam passes through it, and so regions containing gold appear darker than regions containing containing carbon. Um, where we had the um, particles overlapping, 
and this is a really nice example, uh, that will increase the thickness. So the more sample the electron beam has to pass through before it's imaged, uh, the more chance that there is of uh, a scattering event. And so thicker areas appear um, darker than thinner areas. And so where we have two particles overlapping like so, you can see that appears darker where the overlap occurs and lighter where it doesn't. Okay, so they are the two, uh, fi the first two contrast forming mechanisms, that is uh, mass and thickness. The third type of contrast forming mechanism is diffraction contrast. We can see here that we're at 100,000 times magnification and we can see lots of nanoparticles. Um, all the nanoparticles are roughly the same size and they're all made of gold. So there's no change in mass and there's no change in thickness. So we're not gonna get uh, any contrast from those two contrast forming mechanisms. Um, however, some nanoparticles such as this one and this one and this one that are the same size as neighboring particles appear darker. Um, so what's happening here is that in these darker particles, there are lattice planes that are lined up at a critical angle with respect to the electron beam. And this means that they're in the right angle for the electrons to scatter in phase. When they scatter in phase like this, we call this diffraction. And we have a mathematical formula for working out the angle uh, of scattering needed for the electrons to scatter in phase. And we call this Bragg's law. This is exactly the same as in X-ray diffraction, except we're using electrons, not X-rays, and so our wavelength might be different, uh, the lambda in Bragg's law. So let's look at the diffraction pattern we can get. So I'm just gonna um, demagnify a little bit to uh, 50,000 times and insert an aperture. Uh, maybe a little bit less magnification. Uh, this aperture is just going to select an area from which we will get the diffraction pattern from. So we don't want to use the whole sample. Um, and then we'll go to diffraction mode. So I literally just press a button. and then we get the diffraction pattern. So here we can see uh, the diffraction pattern. So let's just go through what we can see. In the center, we have a bright spot. Uh, this is all the electrons that haven't been scattered. This is about a thousand times brighter than any other feature we can see in the pattern. And so we block this off uh, so we don't damage the camera. Um, so, as we move away from the center, we are moving out further and further at increased angle um, that the electrons have been scattered by. And what we see is that at certain angles, such as here, um, uh, we get strong scattering. And this is the diffraction that we were talking about before. And by using Bragg's law, we can show that each of these rings that we can see corresponds with a, uh, a, a distinct crystal lattice plane uh, for gold. So the first one we can measure, and that will give us the 111 plane for gold. Uh, note that each particle will just give us a spot on the ring. So if we look here, we can see perhaps that this ring is composed of separate spots. Um, but we have maybe thousands of nanoparticles forming this diffraction pattern. And so all those nanoparticles are in different orientations. So they rotate around the center and they're all scattering at the same angle. And hence, they build up a ring. Each of the individual diffraction spots builds up a ring. The final thing to note is that as we increase the angle, away from the center. We are decreasing the uh, size of the lattice plane that formed that diffraction ring. So if we look at Bragg's law, 
we can see that there is a inverse relationship between the uh, the angle of diffraction theta and the lattice spacing dhkl. Uh, we can use this information to measure the lattice constant of our material, which for gold is 0.4 nanometers. Okay. The final thing I will show you today is high resolution TEM. This is where we will increase the magnification to 2 million times magnification and uh, we will start to see the atomic structure of the gold, hopefully. Uh, first, we'll need to find one which is in the right orientation, um, because what we're going to need is for the planes of the gold crystal to line up with the electron beam, and that way we'll, we will be able to image those planes. Uh, so I'm gonna pick one, uh, this one in the center. I've cheated, I've already found it, and I think it's good. So now we'll magnify. Um, so we're starting at 200,000 times now and going up and we should start to see uh, as we do so that the uh, crystal, if I find it again, oops, just lost it for a moment. Let's bring it back to the middle. Here we are. So at 1.5 times. 1.5 million times magnification, and here we are at, at 2 million times magnification. If I just increase the brightness, so you can see there, um, here we have the gold atoms arranged in the crystal lattice. And these are aligned with respect to the electron beam, so that we can see them. And actually what we're looking at are stacks of gold atoms arranged in a column and working down the column. So we're not actually looking at individual atoms because obviously the gold particle is in 3D and we just see a 2D image. By looking at the, uh, by looking at the, where the gold atoms are in the crystal, we can tell the symmetry of the crystal and we can find out what structure the gold has and we can also measure directly the spacing of the lattice planes. So we need to refocus just slightly there. And then I'm going to take an image. Nice. We can also see um, what atoms are arranged on the edge and, uh, and what facets of the crystal are on the edge. So here we can see there is a 111 facet on the edge. And we can correlate this information with other measurements, such as the catalytic activity of the nanoparticles. And this can help us develop nanoparticle samples for oxygen evolution reactions, nanoparticle catalysts for oxygen evolution reactions. Um, let's just move around and have a look at some other nanoparticles. Um, we can see different nanoparticles are in different orientations. That's what we discussed um, when we talked about diffraction. And that means we don't see quite so clearly the, uh, the, nano, the, the atoms in this, in this crystal, in this particle. Okay. So we're back to two million times magnification. And if I just carefully focus here and take an image. In this nanoparticle, we can see that we have a, um, the, the atoms are arranged in this region in a different way to how they're arranged in this region. And at the boundary of the two regions, the change is abrupt. We call such changes a stacking fault, and this is a type of defect in the crystal, and uh, it's due to the way that the nanoparticles are formed, how they, how they grow, and the kinetics involved in that. Um, I think that's all I was going to show you today. 
in the team. I hope you've enjoyed this demonstration. And I certainly have.